Eden Burr, thanks for the great setup, uh, great presentation. I think we're all of like minds as we start thinking about what's next in agriculture, uh, the opportunities that are coming forward, uh, past accomplishments and future challenges. My mentor, friend, uh, Norman Borlaug, uh, was a faculty member at Texas A&M. Uh, that's the reason I took my first job at Texas A&M, was to work with him for the last five years of his public life. I met him in 1984 when I was an undergraduate in agronomy at Oklahoma State University. Uh, I was going to be the next Norman Borlaug. I was going to feed the world. And he said, hunger is no longer an agronomic problem. It's an economic problem. Well, there are certain depths of depravity to which I will not go. And economics is one of them. So, um, I'm sorry, it's an engineering economics thing. It's funny. Yeah, so, so um, but what he said is if you really want to understand the human condition, and if you really want to solve the hunger problem, you have to understand all aspects of how humans live together on the land. Well, that's a fairly tall step for a then 22-year-old, 21-year-old kid. But that's what I've been doing for the last, well, 30 years, 35 years, trying to understand how we live on the land. And it's become really all of our mission to understand how we live together on the land. So that means we're not just worried anymore about production issues and economic issues and the farm as the economic unit. We're worried about the community as the economic unit and as the social unit. And that means we engineers have to understand social sciences and economic theory and fundamental issues about equity. And then there are the ecological, environmental issues that we also have to understand. This has gotten very complex very fast. It always was that complex. We just had some elbow room. The elbow room is gone. In order to know where we're going, we have to know where we came from and how we got there. I spent a lot of time with journalists and with activists trying to explain why agriculture does what agriculture does, why producers do what producers do. And the thing is, I have yet to meet one, and I've traveled the world, I've yet to meet one, except for a group in China, who remember what hunger is. What we all do know is that we're in this expansive human population boom, uh, where we are moving upwards to probably 7.5 billion right now, and we're going to probably top out at somewhere around 11 billion. Now, this red line is the most exciting line. This is the uh, percent growth of the population. You notice it peaked about the year I was born, 1962. It peaked. And the population rate, the rate of increasing is, increase is dropping. That's the most important data set in human history. If you're concerned about a living planet and human equity and human prosperity, we're moving, as our dean just told us, we're moving to 10 million people pretty quick. We've got to feed 10 million people. With the earth we have, we're already using one and a half to two times of that earth for other resources. Agriculture uses 43% of Earth's surface. If you include grazing, terrestrial service, if you include grazing and pasture already, if we're going to feed that many more people, another two billion people coming to dinner in the next 40 years, without eating the planet, we have to do what Jason Clay of the World Wildlife Fund says and freeze the footprint of agriculture. We have to intensify production on the land currently in production. That is the only way we're going to achieve these goals without eating the planet. I'll remind you of where we came from. In 1950, 30% of humanity was malnourished, chronically malnourished. Half of us were food insecure. Half of us didn't know if we were going to have food next week. Now, how does this apply to this issue of conservation? Um, if you understand hunger, you understand that I, mean, I consider myself a fairly avid conservationist. I think what I do, the reason I do what I do is because I care about other living things, alien vita, other life, biodiversity. I'll kill the last mountain gorilla to feed my family without hesitation. That's what hunger does to you. Although Leopold, in his introduction to a Sand County Almanac, uh, said that, it was, it, that we could little worry about these things wild until mechanization taught us how to produce more food, and science taught us the drama of those living things, and we no, no longer had to worry about where our breakfast came from. 
We can't worry about these things wild until we don't have to worry about where our breakfast comes from. Conservation is a prosperity opportunity. When you're starving, conservation is not a priority. This is a Chinese food market today. Only 11% of humanity is still hungry. Those 845 million of our brothers and sisters who are chronically malnourished today, though, are not malnourished because they can't get access to food. We can meet their caloric needs, not their nutritional needs, there's a difference, but we can meet their caloric needs with 30% of the rice we lose today post-harvest. We are engaged in producing agriculture at unprecedented levels across this planet. We can feed the planet today, so why aren't we? Paul Collier makes it very clear in his book, The Bottom Billion. Folks can't afford the food. Today's farmers are feeding, right now, 6.6 .6 billion people today. 6.6 .6 billion people are nourished by the producers from the land. That's the population of 1996. We are on the cusp of ending hunger, which is what Borlaug and his companions set out to do with the Green Revolution. It wasn't about feeding the world. It was about ending the tyranny of hunger, about eradicating hunger from the human experience so that humanity could prosper. And part of that goal was to reduce fertility rates because Norm told me in 1984 uh, that he watched, when I first met him, he said, I watched the population muster devour my life's work. He lived long enough to realize that, in fact, our, our efforts to actually reduce hunger and to increase human prosperity is reducing population growth. He lived long enough to understand that we will see that moment where the population monster is slain. What we forget is that in the 1950s, global child mortality, death before five years of life, was greater than 22%. One in five children didn't see their fifth birthday. If you've ever lost a child, you know what that does to you. One in five. It's less than 4% today. It's still too damn high. Now that 4% today is because largely of preventable waterborne disease. 6,000 children will die today due to preventable waterborne disease. 6,000. How many engineers in the room? A 55 gallon barrel of sand, a gallon of bleach, and a community of children who live. This is not hard technology. This is not high technology. This is simple civil society. Have an infrastructure so that you can actually reduce suffering. Engineers save more lives through, through management of, of, of fecal coliforms and other pathogens from our waste we're here for save more lives than all the doctors in all the world ever will. I'm a eighth generation Okie on the Cherokee side, fifth generation on the Mennonite German side. My Mennonite German grandfather lived through this and this. This is actually West Texas, so this is more Ben's country than mine. Uh, we have had bad experiences in agriculture. We have the, the largest, uh, the, to date at least, the largest ecological failure in the United States that we've experienced to date, maybe changing, was this agroecological failure that we created. It was exacerbated by a 10 year drought of record, but we created it, but we learned from it. And because we learned from it, we created an agency Who's here from the NRCS? You guys have changed the way the world does agriculture. Your agency changed the world. Now back to this issue of fertility rates. We look at fertility rates around the world. Well, fertility rates, the number of children a woman chooses to have in her life. <laughs> chooses to have. So if we look at the global number, so the global number is this little sort of green line. Uh, all of these data come from our world and data, by the way, the UN Population Vision, great website, I recommend you go there, uh, your data geek. So in 1950, when Norm was doing his work, the global average was five. Some areas, it was six or seven. Now, we're here in the sort of uh, Scandinavian uh, descendant north. How many of you, how many of your grandparents had more than five children? Hands up, everyone look around. More than five children. How many of your parents had more than five children? Wow, 
I get a Scandinavian North. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have more than five children? Two in the room? You don't like kids, right? That's what I would take away from that. You guys hate children because you're apparently not having them. No, it's just we have fewer children as we become more prosperous for a whole suite of reasons, not the least of which we don't need them for labor on the land anymore. And we also have other ways to avoid it because we know what causes it. Now we know how to prevent it. And so the ability to have fewer children transforms our, uh, our biology. It transforms our society. What that means is, children, on average, we're having less than five children. We're down around 2.4 right now. In the global north, we're under one. The thing is, this is the replacement rate, about 2.1, because my brother and I both have three children each, and we both agree that the only way we're going to have grandchildren is if we adopt them and give them away at Christmas, because our children aren't having children. And so that's what's happening in the global north. So zero population growth is 2.1. We're way below that in the United States, in Europe, and in Russia. Way below that. We are approaching, and I'm 56, so I probably won't see it, but some of you, Betsy and others, will live to see zero population on the planet. First time in human history where our population will start declining, not because of natural, natural disasters, not because of Mel Gibson post-apocalyptic uh, uh, bad things, but because we are prosperous as a species. So when I work with our conservation organizations, we, and this is Jason Clay's position with World Wildlife Fund too, we have to, we're in a triage moment, we have to save what we can to about 2050, 2060. And at that point, we will start to recover land, resources, opportunities, because we will be in a prosperity economy anymore. Now, my economist colleagues and friends um, assure me that you can actually have a viable economic system with decreasing demand. Um, I'm not sure what that looks like because from what I can tell, growth is the only way popular economics expand, but um, that we're going to have to experience that. I think we're looking at a post-consumer uh, approach to economics, but that's why I'm an engineer, as I said. Prosperity from the land creates opportunities for people to improve their lives and the lives of their children around the world. It worked in the United States, it's working all around the world. I'll remind you that to Norm and his colleagues, ending hunger was just the first step in providing for a better humanity. Just the first step. In 1950, 44% of the world was illiterate. Now most of them live in Washington, D.C. That's my standard goal. <laughs> right. Today, more than 86% of us can read and write. We are actually actually becoming a fully literate species. This is it's an amazing opportunity. So how did we get here? Well, I don't have to tell you how we got here. Sweat and science. It's hard work. We got here because we got out in the fields and we, got our, we broke our fingernails off and we got our boots dirty and muddy and we learned. And we tried and we failed and we tried and we failed and we tried and succeeded. And we learn. That's how we got here. So where are we going? Well, what got us here will get us there. We have this anti-science movement from all sides of the political spectrum. Anti-GMOs from the left, anti-climate change from the right. That's why left and right are not different than the same batch. Uh, and so we have to stop the silliness. We have to recognize we have real challenges ahead. Remember, 6,000 children will die today due to preventable waterborne disease. Remember, 890 million of our brothers and sisters today are chronically malnourished, and all of that's fixable. In the United States, we have uh, consolidated this process of continuous improvement into an ANSI standard, ASAP ANSI standard. It's a relatively straightforward process of continuous improvement where we define, plan, and implement. Defining our goals for sustainability are multi-stakeholder initiatives. Fuel the market is one of the world's best in agriculture, and row crop agriculture, uh, leading this process. We plan. The planning process is a, is a producer-supplier initiative, engaging with uh, our checkoff groups, National Cotton Council, NCBA, NPDB, U.S. Poultry and Egg Federation, or U.S. Uh, I guess the Poultry Roundtable for Sustainability, 
Then we implement. That's also a multi-stakeholder and producer initiative. Remember what I said about understanding our communities and how we work together? We used to do these things in sort of small areas, and we used to understand that we can make a farm profitable. Now we understand that having a farm profitable is not enough because that farm needs labor, and that those kids need to go to school. You have to have a community that's sustainable. It's the same way here. This is a full-on, all-hands-on-deck effort. Now, one of the tools we use, and this is where I get technical, and I'm sorry, uh, because I enjoy it first part of this presentation a whole lot more than this, but you gave me an hour, so. Uh, the role of LCA, life cycle assessment, is how we measure this stuff. Because it is about science. It is about the numbers. It is about getting it right. And understand when you get it wrong and trying to figure out why it went wrong. And it goes wrong a lot. So we use life cycle assessment, which is really an inventory accounting method. We perform uh, as a way to help define and then assess. We perform life cycle assessments, benchmarks, identify hotspots for improvement. And let me give you a few examples of these in animal agriculture. And then we use interpretation of the life cycle assessment to find research directions, focus on areas that can move the curve. Life cycle assessment is a standardized methodology as well. ISO standards uh, are well documented. You guys all have access to these slides, so uh, if, you need, if you need any information further, you can reach out to me. Life cycle assessment isn't complicated. Uh, it's not rocket science, it's accounting. And we all know that that's not complicated. Did you do your taxes this year? <laughs> uh, knowing which bucket to put that in to get the best return on the least, to pay the least taxes, that's not so easy. This, the challenge we have with allocation in that life cycle assessment is analogous. So we start with a goal and scope. We get a whole lot of data, inventory data, we evaluate the impact, we interpret the data, and we say, okay, that might, doesn't make any sense, and we figure out why it was wrong, and we work with our stakeholders. We're in the midst of doing, with this, doing this with the National Corn Growers Association, and we're trying to evaluate uh, issues and problems, and so we're, we go through this iterative process time and time again, and with uh, NCBA as well, and we've done, we work with National Corn Board and U.S. Poultry Medic Federation and others to identify hotspots, to benchmark, and develop strategic planning based upon a functional unit. And it's not that complicated. You have this system. We've already been introduced to Aaron to systems thinking today. Uh, so we can do some little systems model. We have a bunch of systems, uh, elements of a system that have uh, extractions from the environment that go in together and ex uh, into the systems, extractions from the environment for the whole process, releases to the environment. Those are the impacts typically. Those are the bad things to produce a product. So life cycle assessment takes us hundreds of individual emissions and this just spreadsheets of these things from the environment, or, or these emissions to the environment. We follow the environmental cause effect change with a, a lens to figure out what the impacts are. That's what we do with life cycle assessment, simple. So you end up with a, a project, a proposal, a program like SEMA Pro, it's a commercial program, we're using Open LCA more and more because we believe that you should use proprietary software for public decision making and policies. So we're moving more towards Open LCA, but it's still clunky. So we use this commercial, uh, we have this flow of materials that go into something, and we get these results, and we have midpoint categories, and then we have uh, damage categories, and then ultimately a single score. Well, single scores are great for making decisions, but the problem with this is that your confidence in the quantitative results goes is strongest right here, and your uncertainty uh, goes up as you go this way, but this is what helps make decisions. Now, I've been, uh, again, interviewed quite a bit by the press lately, and I've been, and many people have suggested that I'm an advocate of agriculture as a scientist, that I shouldn't be an advocate, and what I suggest is I'm an advocate of feeding people. Uh, and that feeding people is good. But I also suggest that I'm tired of being right, but ineffective. I'm tired of knowing the right thing to do and even screaming from the mountaintops, this is the right way to go. Now in the Old Testament, we have a word for those. What are they called? Prophets. What happens to prophets? They die. They're usually fed to lions. Uh, so, so being a prophet, you're, maybe after you're dead, they'll look back and say, you know, maybe we should have followed Daniel. Uh, well, that's not really my goal, to be a prophet. My, I would rather actually move us to that promised land rather than 
stand on the mountain and say, that's the way to the promised land. I'd rather move us there. So being effective means we have to move from areas of confidence to areas of uncertainty in, in improving decisions. We have to know who's making the decisions, how they're making the decisions, and what decisions they're making. And we have to have the science that helps drive them with a certain level of certainty. So who cares about sustainability and why? In the food supply chain, our retailers care about sustainability, consumers care, questions about why. Um, our colleagues from Field of Market can tell you probably better. But we have this food production process and distribution, direct wholesale, retail market consumption, simplified food chain, the really safety, security, and stability concerns. Three things. Um, it, it's Lee Scott was the uh, CEO of Walmart several CEOs ago, and in one of his milestone meetings, he said it's bad for business to kill your customers with your products. <laughs> so you just ought to do that. They were dealing with intentional adulteration of pet food in that case, but human food in China, from China. Safety, security, and stability of your supply chain. The ability to put products on the shelf. The ability to put safe products on the shelf. Safety is a key issue in um, in food systems. So the three big questions. What are we trying to sustain? Who gets to decide? And what are more sustainable decisions? That's it. Now as we look at these questions, we realize that it's a big food production supply chain, even just in the United States, but it's a global supply chain. So let's try to align our priorities. Let's try to get this right. And we've been working, those many of you in the room, We've been working together for over a decade to do this. Aligning our priorities helps us provide focus on activities and programs, amplifies impacts across indicators, creates common language method and understanding across sectors. I can remember 10 years ago when we would, when we would present it, uh, groups like this, the, the standard phrase was, nobody knows what sustainability is, everyone has a separate definition for it. I don't hear that much anymore because we've defined it collectively. We know what it is now. We know how to get there. We know how to measure. It really ticked off our European environmental colleagues, our cousins in Europe, who were using sustainability as a cudgel to beat up on modern agriculture because we owned it. And then they, so now they don't talk about sustainability anymore. They talk about uh, agricultural ecology, uh, agriculture ecology, which is not a new term either, except for the way they define it. It means small farms producing in a way that that farmer will go out of business, and then someone else will move in and go out of business in that small farm. Uh, French farmers, European farmers are dying. They're in worse shape than U.S. farmers. U.S. farmers are in pretty tough shape. So this, there are times when we can say, thank God we're not in Europe. This is one of those areas. Expands common opportunities for engagement of stakeholders, engage, enables sharing of improvement technologies and practices. So now we're talking about moving the curve. If we look at soil erosion, the proportion of populate of farms that have soil erosion and, and from soybeans, this typical probability distribution, we can see that on a, on a central tendency national average in 2010, we lose a certain amount of, of soil uh, per, uh, per bushel of soybeans produced. Most of our soybean producers have low erosion. A few have very high erosion. So what do you do? You go where the erosion is and you fix the problems there. And if you address the problems where the problems exist, you move the curve. Moving the curve is a simple concept. Make things better. Incremental improvement matters because incremental improvement over time turns into what looks like big steps. What looks like 50% of humanity is chronically malnourished to 11% of humanity is chronically malnourished. Big steps, but there are small increments. We set goals. We set goals using a common language. Goals of uh, the language of our goals are aspirational, strategic goals, which belong to our stakeholders. Aspirational goals, we're going that direction. Strategic goals, we're going to set a specific time and date, or time and amount. And these belong to stakeholders. But then management goals belong to the producers because we never tell producers how to produce. One of the biggest, biggest lessons that we've had to get across to our NGO community in the United States, we don't tell producers how to produce. We don't tell processors how to process. We agree on what's important, and we work on making those important things better. And we report them publicly, and we use transparent systems to measure and operate. So this is that starting at the beginning, defining. Defining sustainability for the enterprise, key performance indicators, and metrics. Now, key performance indicators are just things we care about. Nothing fancy. What do you care about? 
We've worked with, again, we've been at this for a decade. It's easy, we care about water quality. Well, how the hell do you measure that? Uh, and then if you even agree on how you're gonna measure it, who's measuring it? What are they measuring? When are they measuring it? Who's gonna report it? These things get complicated very quick. What we do agree is that all of our key performance indicators should be outcomes-based, science-driven, technology-neutral, which means we don't define the technology that improves them, or that, that's not our job. That's below that line on the, on the management curve. And then transparent. We tell the world. You tell the world. We have strong alliance of these methodologies across U.S. agricultural initiatives, strong alliance. Everyone's got their twist because every agricultural production sector is a little different. But these standard methods have been broadly adopted. And these methods didn't come out of nowhere. They came out of, an, uh, again, our work with Field to Market. And how long have we been at this? 2006. 2006. If I can do my math, that's 13 years and counting. Right? So we've been at this a long time. It was a small group when we first met um, in D.C. And now it's, you'll tell us, a lot of people now. So. The Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture focuses on defining, measuring, and advancing sustainability of food, fiber, and fuel production. Annual report from Field to Market uh, was one of our earliest collective projects to figure out, to tell our story of where we came from with row crop agriculture. So just an example, if we take this particular crop, which is important to those of you who raise animals, we can see that corn's impact from 1980 to 2011, decreased land use 30%, decreased soil loss uh, per bushel 67%, Decreased irrigation water per bushel, 53%, 43% reduction in energy use, greenhouse gas emissions by bushel, efficiency metrics reduced by over a third. That's from 1980. I was in college in 1980. That's dramatic improvement, science and sweat. That's how we got there. So if we look at corn, we look at total production, yield per acre, planted area, We've seen a 33% increase in planted area and 119% increase in yield in production. Yield per acre, 61% increase. Cotton, I'm going through the, the feeds here. So I'm not, all of these are important, but these are the big feeds. Cotton, only 2% increase in planted area, 42% uh, increase in yield per acre, 35% total production. Soybeans, 120% total pr production increase and only 20% more land because we got a 63% increase in yield since 1980. Actually, this is, yeah, 1980 to 2015. Being married, this is exactly the sort of uh, progress we need to keep at. Now the question is, can, can we keep growing? Can we keep making these improvements? Now our colleagues at Monsanto, Bear Crop Sciences, and our colleagues at Syngenta and at DuPont think that these agronomic crops still have a, as much as a double yield potential in their genetics. We're at the frontier of the most dramatic advancement in agricultural science since the plow. We are probably going to see this replicated in the next 10 years because of advancements in genetics alone. But it's not just in genetics. We have plant-scale robotics coming online. Plant-scale robotics where you use mechanized weeding through plant recognition, we have, uh, well, that's already out, we yeah, have smart implements. We have information, that, uh, the amount of field we get, or data we get off a of field is sub-meter, square meter scale. Almost plant scale data we're collecting, almost at a uh, multiple times per day's time step. That sort of monitoring, that sort of assessment, of course, creates more data than we know what to do with, that's the data revolution, but it creates decision points and opportunities for innovation. Automation and, and autonomous vehicles. I just saw that a company just got an FAA license for using autonomous uh, drones to do, for deliveries. The stupid Amazon vision of dropping boxes on people's heads. <laughs> but what that means is it's gonna open up for agriculture too. FAA, FAA, FAA is finally opening up uh, for commercial pur purposes and then agricultural drone technology will expand even more. Let's talk about animals. In poultry production, uh, we did a, conducted a life cycle assessment where we looked at inputs, feed, water, bedding, fuels, electricity, through various stages of production, uh, multiple generations of the bird, 
looking at waste, litter mortality is waste, and then coat products, spent hands, broilers, litter, and residual litter, to evaluate where we came from, the retrospective. Now, and that's part of, the, part of that retrospective. I grew up, I, mean, I still see these, these barns that are typically used to store all the crap that the folks have accumulated. They're not growing chickens anymore. They're old washing machines and dryers and old refrigerators and stuff in there now. Uh, fortunately, they're starting to blow down and we're starting to bulldoze them off and, and restore the land a little bit. But we have these 1965 production houses, the modern production system, this is 2010, right? 10 years on, we, the ventilation systems have improved dramatically. Lighting systems, just converting our lighting in poultry houses to LED is saving tremendous amounts of money, reducing heat loads, improving the quality of life for the birds. This is my favorite model shot. Uh, and it's an amazing thing. We didn't do this. Uh, this came from um, Zudoff at L. It's an amazing story of success. And you know what? I see this in the uh, NGO environmentalist literature as an example of bad. Because this hen is less happy than this hen. Uh, is the, this fundamental notion that this is somehow a perversion. I've eaten that chicken. <laughs> and it makes pretty good soup, and that's about as far as it goes, right? I grew up in Oklahoma with yard birds, and that's what, so it, we have to make decisions, and we have to be better at telling our colleagues, our cousins in Europe, our colleagues in the conservation organizations why we do what we do, and what the consequences of that chicken will be to all the other environmental things we care about, like greenhouse gas emissions, like starving people. 65 broiler was 66 days of production. Now we're at 47 days and dropping. 44 days is not uncommon now. 1.6 kilos of market weight, or 1.7 kilos. We're now 2.6, about right, Paul? We're still in the same neighborhood. Here's the big story. 2.44 kilos of feed to produce a kilo of live weight in 65. We're down to 1.9, under two kilos per kilo of live weight. It's incredible feed efficiency conversion. Mortalities dropped by a third. You still have work to do there. 4% mortality is still pretty high uh, if you're hauling those birds off. So if we look at sort of the environmental impacts, if we look at the red bars of the impact of the industry from 1965 to 2010, so this is sort of analogous, uh, Dean, to your uh, Minnesota program where you're looking at what happens if, uh, if we didn't make these improvements. So if we look at uh, 2010, if we, we see uh, the impact of the entire poultry industry, across ozone depletion, global warming, smog, acidification, et cetera. You can see that it's been relatively, uh, uh, the impact has, has been reducing. Uh, the decrease in the impact has been significant from live, uh, from across them. But what would happen if we didn't, if we used to produce the same number of birds with the, um, with the technology of 1965? It would be dramatic. Instead of seeing reductions, we'd see dramatic increases. These are the environmental impacts. I like this picture of pigs. Sorry, National Pork Board, but I like this. this, this is, these are pigs on the move. So, changes in the pork and global warming potential from 1965 to 2015 across the various parts of the feed, of, of the production uh, inputs. So we have pigless at the top, field, manure field emissions, barn emissions, heating, which is very small, feed, uh, infrastructure, electricity, and others. So you read the bar graph. And you can see the feed has been going down. We see that the barn is actually increasing a little bit because our barns are getting bigger. These are the decisions we make. We make these decisions so we can reduce mortality so that we can increase feed conversion efficiency. Some of the others have stayed pretty much the same. So this is the other thing life cycle assessment tells us. It tells us where the problems occur, where we made improvements, and what improvements we can make in the future. Now, if we look at energy use, lifespans, infrastructure, <coughs> feed, piglets, et cetera, feed's still the biggest bar. And we have production down cycles, which have overall redu reduced energy use for the whole U.S. herd, but you can see what we're talking about here. 2015, we haven't seen a lot of increases or changes there. We've seen heating start to increase as we start to man manage uh, barn temperatures more explicitly. Feed's still the big one. The land use impact is a big story. This is the big story. So we've seen dramatic losses of, of 
uh, square meters per area required to produce a kilogram of live weight table. Dramatic reductions. That's feed efficiency improvement because land use comes from the feed. This is why we don't raise pigs out of the paddocks anymore. That and the fact that there are all sorts of really bad diseases that they're subject to when we do that. Big production, I struggle with that to tell this story. Now all of you, because you guys have some of the world's experts in the room that are gonna be talking about this the rest of the day, so I'm gonna be brief about this. I wanna give you a bit of the Putman, Toma, and Rotz uh, summary of uh, life cycle assessment uh, for the US beef industry. Really what we're doing here is we're trying to figure out where the room for improvements are across all of these impacts and how can we use life cycle assessment to figure out. And we recognize that in order to do that, we have to separate out regionality because regionality goes to climate and it goes to land use, common land use practices, production strategies, et cetera. <laughs> so we define the world, into, uh, the beef world into these uh, three range of areas for ranches and for feed yards. A life cycle assessment, we use open LCA. Um, we use a bunch of two, uh, uh, foreground unit processes uh, and in background systems. And manure, manure emissions were attributed to crops in which it was applied. So good news, beef. Manure is not your problem. It's the crop growers' problem. So we'll share that with our crop growers. From a life cycle assessment, this is a product allocation challenge. Manure is not waste. Manure is profit if it's properly applied. It's worth something. <laughs> and so if we look at the variability across the Northern Great Plains, for example, in a uh, kilogram of live weight from global warming potential, we see variability. And we see variability in the Southern Great Plains, it's even greater in the Midwest, even greater. That variability means that we have potential practices we can explore that might be able to reduce the impacts within a region. And this allows us to start exploring those practices. We're not there yet. But some of, those, some of the variability is just inherent to the operation or the location. Land use, uh, this, this goes to actually the uh, feedlots. The feedlots carry a lot of the burden for land use because they're bringing the feed in and that feed takes land. Grazing does not. And then water consumption. Um, Somebody in Nebraska left a tap on, I think. I don't know. <laughs> so, no, we, we, these things are just highly variable, and that's what we're learning. Some things you can control, some things you can't. Uh, for finished steer, gate to gate, we can see that we can look at where the global warming potential come from, so it comes from, from animal speed on the farm, purchase speed, or resources. We're starting to see that the animal, I'm mean, sorry, purchase speed starts to increase dramatically as we move to feed loss, which is normal, it's rational. So our opportunities for improvement start to decrease. Uh, in pasture systems, it's the animal. Um, and then land use, of course, flips a little bit. Um, and then water consumption, again, our, when, when you define the animal, you've got to keep them healthy, and you've got to keep them watered. And that's where the water, and we also have to keep the dust out, to keep the animals healthy, to keep them water. It takes water to do that. It's gonna be a challenge going forward because we're losing water in those regions where, we need, where we're doing this work. Quick look at dairy. I'm not going to go through our dairy indicators. I think we're going to talk about those a little later. Just to remind you that globally, arable land use for dairy is 188 million hectares per year. Produces 19.3 million metric tons per year of protein. We're going to need 12 million more metric tons by 2050 for dairy. Livestock's taking it on the chin, starting with FAO's livestock long shed. Shadow said that, uh, that grazing and pasture lands and animal production uh, accounts for 8% of total water use, larger for irrigation of crops. Yeah, because we all eat. There are 7.5 billion of us that eat 12, uh, 2,000 kilocalories a day, and if we don't eat, we die. So yeah, we, it's an important issue, that, that it's an important thing we do, agriculture. The notion that we could stop reduce, producing agriculture because of that is not a, a smart notion. Livestock greenhouse gas emissions were estimated at 7.1 gigatons CO2 per year. This is wrong. We help uh, FAO improve these numbers. But the sectors, beef really takes it on the chin again, and dairy, 60% of greenhouse gas emissions. They're enteric methanogen methanogens. Of course they do. 
Kelly Aaron Clark in 2010 estimated that pre-Columbian exchange in North uh, America, we had 30 million bison on the Great Plains that emitted 2.2 teragrams of um, or million metric tons of CO2 a year. Our estimated cattle population in 2010 was 36 and a half million head, 2.5 teragrams CO2 of emissions per year. They're ecological analogs. This is not new methane to the environment. It's not new. It was here before we were here. So cattle aren't killing the planet. It's your SUVs that are doing it. So let's, we are, because we all consume things. So we're trying to advance and sustain human prosperity. We have common cause with our conservation organizations. We have common cause with the United Nations, with the Sustainable Development Goals, because the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, ending poverty, ending hunger, good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation. These are agricultural success stories. We got those things better by doing what we do on the land, prosperity from the land. The challenge is we have to make decisions. We have to be grown-ups. We have to understand that until we stop the demand function for increasing resource extraction, we're going to have to make decisions on which resources we're going to continue to extract. When are we going to stop that demand function? When we hit zero population. Animal agriculture accounts for 40% of ag gross domestic product around the world. 1.3 billion people are employed. 880 million world people living on less than a buck a day. Those starving people would be worse off, drastically worse off, without agriculture because many of them, of those producers are women. It's the only property they can legally own in their countries. Meat production will more than double. Demand will more than double by 2050. Milk production will almost double by 2050. We've got to get it right. We've got to get better at it. We've got to get more intense at it. Because we've got 2 billion more people coming to dinner in the next 50 years, 30 years, and they're not coming from around here. Those areas where we're going to see increased population demand are going to require these sorts of resources. If we're going to have, if we're going to realize Borlaug and his colleagues, Dr. Borlaug and his colleagues' vision of a prosperous humanity, if we too are going to become good ancestors. Thank you. Try and speak loud, and we'll have Dr. Matlock repeat the question for you. Yes, sir. Yeah, have you done an LCA on synthetic meat production? No. Uh, actually, one's already been done. And it depends on what synthetic means, because the, the possible burger is actually a plant based product, it's not a cell based, cell culture based product. Um, and it, what we found is that the, the LCA that we have seen on cell based products. Are, their boundaries are not adequately defined for any sort of comparative purposes. You really need a cradle to grade LCA to make that work. Uh, how many of you have ever done tissue culture? It's a pharmaceutical level process. It's prone to infection, contamination, and that requires aseptic conditions. Uh, and so it's, it's an incredibly energy intensive process. It requires incredibly pure inputs. In my humble opinion, as an ecological engineer, as a bio-ag engineer, it's insane. If you don't like meat, or if you don't want meat, eat plants. That's fine, no judgment. Uh, I don't want to fly next to you in an airplane, but don't do that. Just, de just eat plants. That's fine. But the notion that you're going to do this tissue culture, it's just a, this tissue culture thing, it's just a shiny, bright, new thing that in my opinion has no legs. Literally, no legs. <laughs> Question. As we've seen production ramp up, we've seen the quality of food go down. We've seen sickness in animals and humans go up. And we've seen soil health go down. And the American farmer is getting less, the big ag is getting more. So that's the environment we're in today in the real world. And the question is, what do we do about it? Well, I, I'm more focused on the quality of food. Okay. Well, quantity is important, but quality is also important if we want to look at uh, a society that's healthy. So there's a lot to unpack in that, in that sort of uh, proclamation question. That's good. That, so the question is, how do you balance quality with quantity? And we all know that 
the scaling up constant that there has to be a standardization. All you have to do is buy a tomato at the grocery store and versus picking one off your backyard and buying to know the difference. Um, to know the difference in quality that comes from scale. There are categories of consumers on the planet. And those who are wealthy can go to Whole Foods and pay seven dollars for an asparagus bottle of water, bottle of water with a sprig of asparagus. You understand? And again, your business, not mine. Um, your money, not mine. We still have 890 million chronically malnourished people in the world. They're chronically malnourished because they make less than a buck a day and they can't afford the food. Scale is the only way to make that affordable. Sometimes small scale can make it affordable too because it's local. We do not have good peri-urban agriculture production systems. The opportunity for expanding peri-urban agriculture outside of Nairobi, Kenya, outside of uh, Accra, Ghana, outside of major cities, outside of uh, pick a city in India, within the city, peri-urban ag and inter-urban ag for, for intensive uh, small-scale production of fruits and vegetables is real. And the technology is making that more viable. It employs people, provides available fresh foods. That is analogous to the Green Revolution. It's just not focusing on agronomic crops, it's focusing on fruit and vegetables. It's happening in the United States already. You guys saw yesterday an aquaculture facility, indoor aquaculture facility, producing shrimp. That sort of thing is possible. It requires the one thing that was missing in 1948 with agriculture for small producers, that Borlaug and his colleagues worked hard to make happen, it requires finance. The damn economics thing again. You have to be able to get some, but the availability of microfinance and the, and the uh, my phone's on the table, the, but the proliferation of the technology to access and to, to move money into producers' hands from to, so that they can actually invest in the resources is critical. We need our global development organizations to think small. Not to think $500 billion projects, but to think $50 projects. At least to think about ways to implement those small scale producers. Because this is an example where scaling up, it means scaling up the number of people involved in production. And by the way, that wouldn't be bad for Minnesota either. Yes, sir? Hi, Marty. Hey. Uh, you're very familiar with what's going on in the animal industries in terms of defining sustainability. I am. Uh, next week, in, beef industry is announcing their metrics or they're rolling out their uh, sustainability procedures. Uh, tell us. In your opinion, these industry's efforts to define sustainability, what is that going to mean differently for what we do in the manure management area or the focus we should be taking? So the, the question is how will the, the, the sector level definitions of sustainability indicators and priorities impact the process of, of, of manure management? It, it, you saw the, the data. The data are that waste, waste is a bad word, that animal excrement, manure, is a source, especially in cattle and pork and in poultry too, a major source of water quality concerns, of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and so the opportunities to reduce those impacts is, is clear, it's self-evident, you close the loop. The efforts of these organizations should, and, and in my experience, the, the indicators that we're developing across beef, pork, poultry, aquaculture even, are amplifying the need for closing the nutrient loop and the carbon loop in these systems, amplifying it. So what we've done in the shadows, those of us who work in animal waste, it's not a very good dinner topic for conversation. Those of us who work in this area who've done in the shadows for decades, now are going to be front and center in this challenge to make things better. Uh, there's an old uh, saw that when Dillinger was, or was asked, why do you rob banks? So that's where the money is. <laughs> why do you worry about animal manure? Because that's where the greenhouse gases are. That's where the sweet spot is, literally, for nutrient re recovery. That's where you're going to make the soil healthier. And by the way, I will push back. The cause of the advancements in technology, genetics included in, in agronomic crops, we're seeing more carbon going into our soil now than we have in the last 15 years. Our soils in the Midwestern United States, in the ERS-1 heartland region, have more organic carbon in, that, in them than they had probably since 1950 or before, since we started uh, moldboard plowing. Because we have low-till, no-till conservation tillage practices, we leave organic matter on the ground. We leave it in the ground, and it's making the soil healthier. 
So there's, it's not just either or. It's either and in many cases. We just have to find those. Things. So that manure plays a green fertilizer plays a key role in that. The best thing you can do for a soil to recover it and to advance it is the ecosystem is to add living biota to it, add biomass. Does that answer your question? So get ready for the busy work. It's going to get busy. Let's hope funding follows. I think I think we should see some animal manure NEPA focused research expanding. Uh, if not, we need to probably push a little bit to make that happen. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm curious that you're using like climate change and a lot of information for space allocation, land use, value. What do you see climate variation doing to uh, <coughs> uh, So the question is about climate change. What's climate change? What, what's its impact going to be and what can we, how can we respond to it, I guess, would be the way to summarize that. Well, we're doing a, we're involved in an EPA grant right now with uh, colleagues at Urbana-Champaign and, and uh, UC Davis and Florida asking the fundamental question, what are we going to grow fruits and vegetables in the next 50 years based upon climate change? And so in our analysis, um, from an agriculture perspective, if climate change is a shark, water is its teeth. Water is everything. Now, temperatures matter, too. Hotter, hot, colder, colds are really problematic. Really, water is going to, we can control hotter, hots, and colder colds in many systems. Um, that's called moving them indoors. But what you can't control is if you don't have, if your well goes dry, or if your lake, your reservoir is dry. What do you want to hear from Georgia? You know about Lake Lanier? Yeah, I was there with Sonny Perdue as the governor, <coughs> sitting in Coca Cola's world headquarters, when all the, drops, all the docks in Lake Lanier were laying on the ground because there was no water left for Atlanta. Uh, so, our USDA uh, Secretary of Ag understands the importance of water there too. We have to secure water for agriculture. Cows don't vote. As we look at the allocation of water resources, I mean, you folks up here in the land of Tin Lakes, uh, <laughs> you, you guys understand the value of water, but you take it for granted because you're not thirsty. Uh, anyone here from, I don't know, California? Uh, how about Texas? Yeah. Yeah. How about I mean, we, we all know the, the sort of the, the high plains and uh, Great Basin desert areas. We all know the Arizona, New Mexico, uh, and Utah struggle for water. How about anyone here from I don't know Mississippi? Um, no one from Mississippi. Wow. So we're all running short of water. Arkansas is running short on water because we have competing demands for it across the industrial and municipal sector, and agriculture gets short shrift. So we're going to have to secure agriculture for our production future. We need to secure it regionally. Most of the United States, the central United States, is going to get wet. We're dealing with floods. Uh, your river here is at flood stage. We're dealing with floods in the middle of the US. We can't plant soybeans in Arkansas. We need 10 days without rain. It's raining there again today. We can't plant soybeans in Arkansas because it's too wet. Oklahoma, my colleagues from Oklahoma, um, are, yeah, you've, down, you've now become West Texas. The entire state has become West Texas. That's, so we're getting drier dries, wetter wets. And those two things are bad for agricultural producers writ large. So how do we adapt? It's all we can do right now. We're going to have to adapt. It means we better know what's coming and we better adjust. We better be able to adjust, or we go out of business. We may lose 30% of soybean producers in Arkansas this year, 30%, and they'll never come back. That land will be expanded to other fewer producers. About it? Thank you, guys. Please help me. Thank you.